So, um, so hello everyone. So my name is G. This is Prashant. So we're going to be talking about how Google built a new cloud on top of Kubernetes. Unfortunately, Sal cannot be joining this presentation. So it's going to just be me and Prashant presenting this. All right. So um, many of you are familiar with the hyperscaler kind of public cloud computing platform and the benefit that, the benefit that um, they offer. And as more and more workloads are shifting to the public cloud, so uh, at Google, we know some customers actually want the, the, the benefit of the cloud, but they want that in a disconnected environment. So those, in, uh, those customers would love to leverage the benefit of cloud computing, but due to like regulatory or security reasons, they can ju cannot just use public offerings. So um, to, to, to better serve those customers, so in 2021, so we start an effort trying to build a new cloud, kind of air gappable cloud at Google. So we want that cloud to be kind of um, like air gappable and look and feel just like our public cloud offerings and uh, but can be completely disconnected from the internet. And, uh, and, and, and more important is able to kind of scale from a very small scale, like a few racks to a large scale. So um, of course, this is like a very audacious kind of undertaking. And uh, the big natural question is um, how to do this. So uh, of course, when you're building something new, um, the first thing you do is actually look around and see uh, what have been built already and whether you can reuse those things, right? So uh, over the years, Google has built like a, a ton of like very amazing internal technology like Borg, Stubby, Clauses, Spanner, and more. And these internal technology enable us to run massive distributed systems, uh, including Search, Gmail, and of course, our public cloud. Um, but we couldn't just blindly use those technologies uh, for multiple reasons. And the more importantly, the, the reason is because those technologies are actually built for a, a very different scale. So Google's internal infrastructure is quite literally built for a planning scale. Um, but the good news is that um, Google has invested in building open source variants of those internal technologies uh, over the years. And so we can kind of let us start small and kind of scale up. So this is one of our key design kind of architecture goals. Right, so um, this naturally leads us to the cloud native ecosystem. So in CNCF, we have so many building blocks that we, uh, that we, uh, that we can, can use to build a cloud. For example, of course, you have Kubernetes, uh, which is a very excellent general purpose resource manager and container orchestration system. You have Kubert, which is built on top of Kubernetes and lets you orchestrate KVM VMs with a common resource management layer. And there are also multiple service mesh options on the table uh, um, that are key building blocks for any sort of microservice architecture. And there are also a lot of other projects like, for example, for image management, you have Harbor, you, and for data point, you have Cilium. So there's a lot of benefit of building on top of those EOSS CNCF ecosystem projects. For example, we don't have to build from scratch and that improve our time to market. And, uh, and usually customers appreciate those kind of like a building of industry standard technologies um, because um, then they can understand and operate if necessary. And, uh, and also like Google being a very big open source contributor uh, certainly helped this because I, so many experts for those technologies are literally just set upstairs. And uh, of course, OSS is where so much of the innovation is happening want to ride that wave. Um, but like all major decisions, um, the, the choice to go with OSS is not without drawbacks. Uh, we would have to pour over a bunch of services uh, into the new stack. Um, and while many of the building blocks were there, um, there were missing functionality that require, uh, like a, like a, to, that's required to build a true cloud experience. And uh, there were also other challenges, for example, to align with our desired tenancy model. All right, so uh, we took the gamble and it worked. So um, GDC AirGap, Google Distributed Cloud AirGap, is our uh, private cloud offering uh, built on top of open source. So it looks and feels very similar to uh, the public uh, cloud offerings, uh, the hyperscalers, and offer many of the same managed services, including VMs, database, Vertex AI, and more. Right, so while I would love to kind of dive into all aspects of our uh, private cloud offerings, it will take like many hours. So uh, instead, in this talk, we'll talk about like, uh, uh, walk you through like three key, key design decisions, explain how kind of open source helped us, and share uh, what the gaps were uh, and, and uh, how we filled them. Right, so, so before we dive into kind of three design principles, we need to understand some of the key kind of, kind of concept first. So this diagram actually shows the uh, cloud resource hierarchy uh, in Google Distributed Cloud. So it's the same as our public cloud, uh, where cloud resources like VM clusters are created inside the project and the project can be grouped together into organizations where the organization-wide policies can be set. 
um, thinks this product can run in an air gaps environment. So we introduce a new concept called uh, universe, where each universe usually maps to a given customer or a, a given a, a fabric in Wuful for a given customer. So each universe consists of one or more zones, uh, and each zone is an independent set of hardware and software stack. Right, so the first design principle uh, is multi-cluster and namespace sameness. It might sound very familiar because there's like actually a lot of talks about this, but we'll get to why this is kind of important for us. So why multi-cluster? There are like many reasons, and some of them are quite obvious. So we're listing a few kind of key reasons here. So first, uh, we need cluster with different types and shapes to accommodate various needs from first-party services and customers. For example, VM managed by VM and service needs to run on bare metal clusters for reasons. And uh, some services teams sometimes actually uh, want special tuning or configuration on their clusters, especially when some of the OSS components are used. Uh, and those configuration tuning might not be applicable to all the, all the other services. And of course, our customer would like their Kubernetes cluster to be in different sizes and shapes to better suit their needs. So second, an organization might span multiple regions and zones. Apparently, you need like multiple clusters uh, for different regions at the very least. Third, uh, one of the primary goals of this product is actually to be able to scale from rack scale to a DC scale. So in a smaller scale, uh, we need virtual clusters in addition to bare metal clusters to better utilize the, the resources uh, in, in those racks because they're, they're, they're pretty small. And uh, so it's not only we need multi-cluster, we also need a hybrid of virtual and bare metal clusters to better suit our need. There's also other apparent reasons, for example, multi-cluster for like fault tolerance and uh, a reduced blast, blast radius. So finally, I think uh, our security team generally prefers service data plane components. For example, the actual workloads that's serving the, uh, the, the traffic to run in virtual clusters and in VM so that container breakout won't kind of affect kind of privileged host stack. Right, so we come up with this kind of cluster architecture. So uh, each GDC zone is a, uh, has a root admin cluster on bare metal servers. So that's the only cluster that has access to various devices and in the zone via uh, out of band management network. And it also runs controllers that, be, that will be responsible for allocating hardware resources like servers to each organization in the zone. Each organization in the zone will have a dedicated infra cluster, infrastructure cluster. So the infrastructure cluster for the organization will be running on bare metal servers. And we can dynamically add more capacity into the infrastructure cluster based on customers' needs. So note that for each organization, we run a set of system pods on the infrastructure cluster. So one of those pods are the actually the management plane API server for the organization in that zone. So this is a place where the customer will uh, kind of crud their cloud resources, like create, update, read, and delete their cloud resources. And we'll get, get to that later. So I want to highlight um, um, that the management plane API server here are separated from the infra cluster API servers. So this design actually uh, provides a very clean separation between customer facing kind of management plane functionalities from internal control plane details and allow us to not leak implementation detail to the end users. So, so if we zoom into like an organization, so within an organization, we support multiple types of so-called virtual clusters. So virtual clusters are just Kubernetes clusters running on VMs. And those VMs are running as pods in the organization infra cluster. So um, there are two types of uh, virtual clusters. One type is actually the customer facing kind of virtual clusters. And, um, and the other is the service clusters that are not visible to the end users. So service cluster are used to host service producer workloads uh, like databases or model servers, et cetera. Uh, note that the, um, the infrastructure cluster is essentially a, a special service cluster, if you think about it that way, that can run on bare metal servers, and it's not visible to the users too. Right, so it's not easy to deal with so many clusters um, uh, with different types and, sh uh, and, and shapes uh, uh, for the service producers. So it will become a huge burden if the platform doesn't provide a way to kind of make this easy and provide consistency across those clusters. So, so naturally, because of this, we apply namespace sameness concept within an organization um, across cluster uh, in, in that organization. So namespace sameness is a not a, a new concept, and people have done this before. So, but in our case, each project uh, will actually have a unique namespace assigned to that, and the namespace will be created across all the clusters within an organization. And the namespace hosts kind of cloud resources, uh, representations, and service workloads uh, for the project. And depends on the cluster type, it hosts different type of resource and workloads. We enforce consistent policies for that namespace across clusters. 
so that from, from like service producer's perspective, it feels like as if their work, workload are running on the same cluster. And policies, for example, um, like administrative policy, like IEM policies, project policy, or networking policy will be enforced consistently. So we also support this concept called shadow namespaces for a given project. So think about shadow namespace as just like a regular project namespace that are linked to the project. So this is for the case uh, where some service actually require dedicated namespaces for each service instance. For example, like say a database instance might require a dedicated namespace, uh, not sharing any namespace with the, the other database instances. And this is actually quite typical for some of the OSS components that we're using. All right, so this is kind of a visualization of the namespace concept, namespace sameness concept that I just talked about, right? So in this particular case, the project backend uh, on the top uh, in, in green box it is a user created project. So a unique namespace called backend will be created on all clusters, including the management plane API server. And cloud resources like uh, are basically namespace resources uh, stored inside the management plane API server. In this case, we have a VM CRD defined there. So, and if the user create a VM, um, the virtual machine pod will be actually created in the backend namespace on the infrastructure cluster, which is bare metal. And for some, and for some services like database services, um, the workload will be actually created in the service cluster. And uh, um, the service producer can request kind of additional shadow namespaces associated with the backend namespace uh, where the actual database pod will be placed. So the policy, as I mentioned earlier, like the policy will be enforced consistently across those, uh, across those cluster for those namespaces, including the shadow namespaces uh, for the project. So, so from service producer's perspective, um, their experience is roughly the same despite the existing of like multiple clusters with different types and shapes. Right, so that's the first principle, um, multi-cluster and namespace sameness. The second principle is, uh, is to embrace Kubernetes resource model, KRM, based API machinery and controller pattern when building a cloud. So this diagram shows a high level of how a cloud service uh, on GDC is built, right? So for each service, we separate its APIs into kind of two major categories, um, the management plane and the data plane. So for management plane, think of that as like mainly related to the life cycle of a cloud resource. Uh, for example, like create a database or delete a VM, those are like management plane kind of operations. For management plane APIs, all service kind of consistently using declarative KRM resource model and, uh, and they define custom resource definitions for their cloud resources and install those in the dedicated management plane API server as we discussed earlier in the talk. For data plane, we split actually into like further two like subcategories. So one category is like for those data plane APIs um, and that has like industry standard, for example, like OCI for container registry, we just use those industry standard. And for some of the Google proprietary like data plane API, like KMS, Vertex pre-trained APIs, and those are gonna be consistently based on gRPC um, API. And then we also support a JSON slash HTTP transcoding layer um, for those APIs similar to our public offerings. So, and policies are enforced by API proxy. So there's an API proxy in front of those, in front of those API services. And uh, API requests will actually go through those proxies and, and the proxy will actually uh, forward those requests to, um, to an, a, like a policy decision point. And policy decision point will make a decision whether to uh, accept requests or deny the request based on policies. And we use the management plane API server as our policy store. Right, so we heavily rely on Kubernetes style controller pattern for building managed services. And the service controller I basically just react to the desired state of the user in the management plane API server and reconcile the system to reach the desired state. We also apply controller pattern pretty much in all of the places. Like for example, we use controller pattern also for our internal infrastructure management and hardware configurations. So this allows us to kind of be able to recover from failures uh, kind of automatically. So one notable difference as compared to most of the OSS controllers is that our service controller typically needs to deal with like multiple clusters. So um, the intent is actually stored inside the management plane API server and the data plane components are usually in a different cluster like the service cluster or infra cluster. So to make this easy, actually we build a thin layer on top of controller runtime to support multiple clusters better. All right, so I'm gonna, now I'm gonna hand over to Prashant to talk about the third principle. Thank you, G. Can everyone hear me? Yes, okay, great. Hi, I'm Prashant Venugopal. I'm going to be talking about um, the networking piece of this private cloud. I'm just going to switch this one and use the other one. Yes. Uh, uh, all right. Okay, the third design principle. 
So the third design principle heavily influenced um, the evolution of our networking architecture for this private cloud. Um, and let's go into what the principle is. So it's treat containers and VMs equally. I mean, like, that sounds very vague and ambiguous, so let's go a little deeper into what that really means. To understand what this, uh, what this principle really means, let's start with what we set out to do. We're building a private cloud. We need to build some networking components for that cloud. What does a typical cloud networking component, uh, networking subsystem look like? Uh, it typically contains some sort of a virtual networking layer whose job is to make sure that workloads have some network plumbing to the physical networking layer, right? You eventually need switches and TORs and whatnot to move packets around, right? The other part of it is now that you have some way of plumbing a virtual networking layer to the physical networking layer, you need to expose some knobs to the customer so that they can decide uh, how to customize this network plumbing. They may decide to connect to multiple physical networks, same physical network, et cetera, et cetera, right? So these are the two core pieces of what typically defines a cloud networking um, layer. <clears throat> and any cloud networking stack, especially a virtual networking stack, typically has three big buckets where features go into. Right? Uh, this connectivity, services, and security. So connectivity is nothing but how a workload talks to another workload within a cloud, or how an entity outside the cloud can communicate with the workload inside a cloud. So east, west, and north, south. Services is a point where you abstract L3 routing mechanisms to a more application level service exposure mechanism. So you use load balancers, L4 and L7 load balancers, and you use DNS for service discovery. Of course, no private cloud or no public cloud, in fact, is going to be complete without some sort of security paradigms at various granularity levels. So you need at least three, these three buckets to be formed, right? But what we really want to focus on, and specifically in the context of this design principle, is this part here, expose workloads uh, related networking knobs. So we use the term workloads because we want to support VMs and containers and we want to expose knobs or configuration patterns to customers where they shouldn't have to worry whether they're using VMs or containers to deploy their applications, right? And we'll talk about why this is important. So the cloud that we aspired towards was built on the premise of treat VMs and containers equally. What does it really mean? Consistent policies and features that can be supported for both VMs and containers on the same platform. Typically, if you look at cloud platforms, they are probably shifting more towards VMs or towards containers. But we know that our customers sometimes don't want to pick. In fact, the on-prem world where we built this product for, there's still a lot of VM-based applications, but they do want to move to the container world. They, we want to give them a path and make it easier for them to move to the container world. Okay? All right, so now imagine that you could bring up a Kubernetes load balancer, a Kubernetes service that can have both VMs and containers as backups. How easy would migration be for these customers? Right? Imagine that you can specify network security rules, firewall rules, using the same API, irrespective of whether you're deploying something as a VM application or as a container application. Right? And then imagine if you are building one first-party services, like databases or AI ML applications, that you want to expose to your customers using the same API. Right? The customer shouldn't care whether you have implemented it using VMs or containers, and you can switch anytime between VMs and containers, as needed. Now, theoretically, some of this could be built by creating a logical data plane that could perhaps be built using a Kubernetes CNI, and we'll talk about why Kubernetes is suddenly getting introduced here, which can support both customer and system workloads, irrespective of the workload type. So the workload could be VMs or pods, could be customer or system workloads, but the same set of knobs and bells and whistles are available for all types of workloads, right? So there's a lot of imagine this and imagine that. So where is this leading to, right? One more imagine. Now imagine making it easier for customers to move to a truly cloud native environment. Right? There are a lot of customers in the on-prem world who want to move to containers, but they've invested so much money and time on VM applications. Right? So we give them a path, maybe they will make the move. Okay, so all of those um, you know, core design principle constructs um, led us to this concept that we call Kubernetes defined networking. How many of you here have heard of the term SDN? Show of hands? Okay, good. So 
when someone talks about software defined networking, at least to us, it typically means you're orchestrating some sort of a fabric and you're trying to set up networking between multiple set of servers and typically it is used in the context of VMs. These are physical servers that are running some VMs and you want to set up some sort of a networking layer among those VMs to communicate with each other. That's what SDN typically brings up in your mind, right? Then we thought about, well, what is going on in the Kubernetes world? So Kubernetes deployments have multiple Kubernetes nodes. Kubernetes by default needs to coordinate between networking between these nodes. So there is a networking fabric in the Kubernetes nodes, right? Without this, there is no successful Kubernetes deployment. Right? So this sort of brought us to an epiphany that there is a built-in SDN that is part of Kubernetes. I mean, when you say it out loud, you say, well, of course, it's obvious, but then we don't talk enough about it. Right? So then the next step would be, well, with all the CNCF ecosystem, the rich set of features and projects that are going on the CNCF ecosystem, and we want to build a platform that treats VMs and, Kuben and containers equally, perhaps Kubernetes is the more ideal platform to build such an SDN layer. Right? We want to make sure that someone configuring a firewall rule does not need to worry whether their application is a VM or a container. They deploy it as a VM today, tomorrow they move it to a container, they don't change the firewall rule. Right? Okay, so what is KDN then? So KDN is a KH-based approach to define, deploy, and manage a network fabric that can support both VMs and container-based applications. But in any networking fabric orchestration system typically has a management plane, a control plane, and a data plane. So in the KDN world, the KRM-based Kubernetes API server, we treat that as the management plane. A KH-based controller ecosystem, we use that as the control plane. And a KH CNI that is supporting container networking, we extend that to support VM networking. Now we have our data plane. So this constitutes at a high level what we call as KDN in this platform. Of course, the bonus here is that Kubernetes being portable, you build it once and you can deploy it in any platform that is going to be built off of Kubernetes. Right? Okay, so again, quite a bit of that was a bit abstract. So maybe let's go a little bit more into uh, concrete examples. What is the difference between KDN and all the other uh, you know, uh, defined networking constructs that you're aware of? So, looks like most people are familiar with SDN, and I assume you're familiar with what Kubernetes networking is, so let's call out what KDN, how is it any different? So SDN typically focuses on VMs, right? KDN tries to focus on VMs and containers equally. Every feature, every networking feature, every networking knob needs to be supported on both types of workloads. This API has to be the same, how you select a workload would need to be the same, et cetera, et cetera, right? Kubernetes networking, of course, focuses more on container networking. There are many variations of an API, or API surface area for SDN. So depending upon which vendor you go with, I mean, you can go with VMware, NSX, you can go with Cisco, ACI, whatever, they all have different, their own sets of APIs, right? With KDN, we try to come up with a consistent API surface. What that means is that you want to do NAT, you do NAT using a simple API. The API is carried over wherever Kubernetes can be deployed. You want to do load balancing, you use the service object, or use the gateway API. You want to do uh, network policy or firewalls, use the network policy API, right? So the, the goal is to try and have consistent APIs, no matter what kind of uh, platform you're trying to build using Kubernetes, right? Of course, that is borrowed as an advantage from the Kubernetes networking stack. Multi-homing. So any SDN stack typically supports things like, hey, I want to connect to VPC A and VPC B. In the on-prem world, maybe it is VLAN A and VLAN B, and I need to connect to a management uh, network and a data plane network. Right? So these are very common constructs in the SDN world. In the KDN world, we also support these constructs, again, for both VMs and containers. There could be containers that could be saying, I want to connect to a data plane network and a management network. We support that with KDN. Right? In the Kubernetes networking world, it's not natively supported. There are some projects like Multus that do allow you to support additional networks, but you always need to have the primary network that we start calling as a default pod network. Okay? And these projects are not feature-rich that you can't support load balancing on them. You can't support network policy on them yet. Okay. So there's some, there's some missing gaps there. Uh, Vendor-specific end of integration. So if you were to get an SDN stack from one of the vendors, and then you want to use it with a F5 load balancer, or you want to use it with Palo Alto firewalls, 
Uh, maybe the SDN stack supports that integration, maybe they don't and you'll have to support it. So it's very vendor specific, depending upon which SDN stack you go with. Versus in the Kadian world, we sort of abstract this out uh, using APIs. You can say network policy API is actually implemented through Palo Alto Firewall for all you care, right? Uh, so you're abstracting out the vendor implementation, or you all can also support vendor-specific APIs if that is the need. Where Palo Alto Firewall or F5 can come up with their own KRM APIs that you can support on your platform. So you support both, right? You have a lot of choice. Of course, again, this is something that we borrowed from the Kubernetes networking stack. Feature-rich network fabric for fault tolerance. So a production-worthy SDN stack typically supports multi-rack scenarios. Right? You don't want to support just all your compute on one rack. Right? It doesn't scale, and also is not fault tolerant. In the KDN world, we support this using multi-cluster concepts that G spoke about. We typically use one cluster as one fault domain, and if that cluster dies, you can always run it on some other cluster. Okay? And uh, in the KH networking world, so there's a bunch of networking feature gaps there. I mean, when you think about multi-cluster, the only thing you can talk about is typically multi-cluster services. Like, what about multi-cluster network policy? What about multi-cluster connectivity? There's a lot of gaps missing there, right? Uh, KH networking, it does support some amount of multi-cluster networking, but we think that there's a bit of lack of feature richness there. And another type of isolation is multi-tenancy. So there's multi-homing and multi-tenancy. If you give the customer an ability to create multiple networks, they can deploy a workload to say, I want the workload to connect to multiple networks. That is multi-homing. I can deploy a workload to connect to a network, but different workloads connect to different networks. So I have a red workload connecting only to the red network and a blue workload connecting only to the blue workload, or blue network. That's multi-tenancy, right? So this is also something that we support natively in KDN. Any SDN, this is a basic construct that is asked for. In the Kubernetes networking world, again, this is not a native integration. Right? This is a missing piece in the Kubernetes world. So what we really want to focus on here are the biggest gaps that we feel are, are a part of the Kubernetes networking stack. Right? The networking construct, networking API that you can define to say, support multi-tenancy, support multi-networking. These are core principles for any SDN stack. Okay, so let's assume you, I hope all of you have... Uh, bought into what we are calling as KDN, and now let's say you want to go build your own KDN. Right? How would you go about do that, right? To do that first, we want to try and bridge the big gaps that we feel is not, uh, is, is part of the Kubernetes networking stack, right? The two big pieces that we felt was missing was supporting multi-homing and multi-tenancy use cases. So we want to try and introduce a networking API where you can define what a network is, and then you can say, workload A, you can tell me which network you want to connect to. And of course, there is all sorts of RBAC and IAM policies around it, so you can secure this, right? There are some efforts that Google and Red Hat and some other companies um, are starting off um, on for this you know, work that we want to bring into Kubernetes OSS. I have some links here. So if you're interested in seeing this become a reality, I highly encourage you to follow these links and uh, maybe participate more actively to bring this to fruition. Okay. Okay. So there's a lot of imagine this and imagine that. Uh, I wouldn't blame you if you start thinking that we're just smoking something and not really doing any real work. So we did manage to build something using all these core concepts, and here is how we built it. Right? So we started creating a networking layer cake. Right? We created a bare metal Kubernetes cluster that we call as an infrastructure cluster. And then we said that every Kubernetes cluster comes with its own SDN, built-in SDN. So this came with its own built-in SDN, which provided connectivity, internal and external load balancing. Let's focus more on the internal. I'll talk about why external needs to be different. Internal load balancing is like cluster IP support, right? It comes with DNS support, and then it comes with firewall. So now you have, an in, you have a built-in SDN available in this bare metal cluster. Then we started supporting KubeVirt and supporting VM networking concepts. Things like what happens when a VM migrates? How do we carry over the IP address from whichever node the VM was on to the new node where the VM is? Static IP configuration. These are things that VM customers are used to. Right? So we started supporting VM networking constructs with KubeBot. Once you start enabling KubeBot on a bare metal cluster, we used those KubeBot VMs to start supporting virtual clusters now. This is like a nested cluster concept, a bit like Inception. Uh, you've had a base bare metal uh, Kubernetes cluster, and now you have virtual clusters that are hosted on that base bare, bare metal Kubernetes cluster. And we have various types of virtual clusters. We have user-facing ones, which are used by customers to run their container workload. We have service virtual cluster, where as a platform we can offer 
database as a first party service or AIML workloads as a first party service. And we have an edge virtual cluster which runs some networking functions. Right? So each of these clusters come with their own inbuilt SDN stack. Right? They provide connectivity, in, uh, internal load balancing, DNS, firewall, etc. The edge cluster is a little interesting. It comes with its own SDN stack, which means it provides connectivity by default. But we need more than that. Remember, we're trying to deploy this platform in an on-prem world. We need some way to communicate with the on-prem world. What that means is that we started building an external uh, load balancing NFV, right? An external load balancing NFV typically involves some sort of BGP communication to tell the on-prem world how to attract traffic to the, uh, to the private cloud, OK? We need DNS communication, et cetera. Uh, then we built in a VPN NFV. We put a routing NFV, and then we put a NAT NFV. So all of these, these are all containerized, right? All of these put together formed an external network integration layer, right? Now you already see a few clusters here. Now you need the connectivity across all of these clusters. You need VMs to talk to the outside world. You need VMs to talk to other VMs. You need VMs to talk to containers that are running inside other VMs, right? So you need connectivity everywhere across all of these clusters. So we supported multi-cluster connectivity. Of course, when you talk from a VM to another container, you need multi-cluster services. You're exposing pods as, as a load balancing, as a load balancing web towards a VM. And you need multi-cluster security. Is the front-end VM allowed to talk to a middleware pod or a back-end pod? Right? Remember, customers can mix and match applications. They are at various stages of their cloud-native um, you know, evolution. So all of this puts together is what we call as our KDN stack. And one such KDN stack is what runs in one particular zone under a single cloud multi-tenancy unit. So when G talked about an organization, that's one cloud tenancy unit inside a single zone. All of this in one zone, you replicate it across multiple zones. Because it's already using multi-cluster, it's just expanding the number of clusters that you need to communicate with. So what are our takeaways from this journey? Um, since we are in a CNCF conference, uh, more in the context of CNCF, how did CNCF ecosystem help us while we're trying to build this platform? We don't have to obviously start from scratch. It's a feature-rich ecosystem. We use KubeWord, we use Cilium as a base for our data plane, and we bridged all the gaps on top of it, right? That really helped with time to market. Now, open, and sta open standard and vendor agnostic. So customers love that, right? You don't need to tie be tied to Google because these are all open uh, ecosystem projects, right? A developer and operator mindshare. You have a lot of talent out there who understand Kubernetes and open source projects. You don't need to be trained by vendors. So this allows customers to operate their private cloud more efficiently. You can hire talent anywhere around the world. Right? How did it get in the way? So obviously, Kubernetes was built for container management, not VM management. But not all customers in the on-prem world are container ready yet. So we have to bring in some VM constructs in and sort of nudge them towards moving towards a container, more container native world. So some of the VM constructs were missing, and we had to bridge that gap. Multi-cluster constructs, which is core to our fault tolerant mechanism, was also not very feature rich. I mean, we could use NCS, but we need a network policy that spans multiple clusters. We need connectivity that spans multiple clusters. Of course, there's mesh, but not everything is L7. We need L4, L3, right? Um, so that's our takeaway from building this product. Um, I think we are open for Q&A. Any questions that we can answer will be here, G and I. Yeah? Yeah. Um, Anthos is a single Kubernetes cluster, typically, that runs containers. Sure, you can, apply it, you can put VMs on it. It doesn't, apply, it doesn't provide multi-tenancy constructs. There's no VPC. There's no multi-VLAN, et cetera, et cetera, right? We want to abstract that out with a virtual layer. There's no virtual layer in Anthos, right? You can talk to the physical network. You can have one tunnel, and you can put everything on that tunnel. That's about it. So this is a lot more sophisticated. Yeah, I would say like Anthos is like a, a, an extension to a cluster as a service, while this is like a, more like a cloud where you have all these other services. So would they support things like connect gateway and Oh, it's just connected. There's no connection. Yeah. 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 But it comes packaged with storage. When you, when you say about multi-cluster, right? We, if we have, uh, can we have a hybrid cluster of uh, GPU bare metal nodes and the virtual nodes, which can be used by a AIML uh, type of a platform? Yeah, you can. Uh, it, it's it's possible. No? Yeah. I don't know. Is, is my mic working? Can you hear me? 
Oh, uh, yeah, I think yes, you can, you can do that. And, and uh, um, actually, we all the user-facing clusters are virtual clusters. So if you want to use GPU for your AI workloads, it has to be in a virtual cluster. And uh, we, we pass through GPU to those virtual machines. Or would the recommendation be to keep the GPU nodes in the base cluster and then use those resources from every other cluster? Is that a possibility too, or yeah, so what would be the? Okay, so we don't have to create vGPU VMs, but we can tap the bare metal clusters GPUs directly from the virtual clusters. Is yeah, that the I, I can't hear you at all. <laughs> you want to use this? Yeah, I think the, I mean, the infra cluster is not, like the bare metal cluster is not exposed to any users. Okay. Uh, and the main reason for that, just like a Google Borg is not like visible to users, that's where we run all these like workloads inside Google, like container workloads in, in Google, right? It's not exposed to the users. So we, we apply our same kind of uh, solutions there, right? So yeah, if you want to use GPU in your kind of like say a Kubernetes cluster, it will be a virtual cluster. And then, uh, and then the GPU on the bare metal cluster will be passed through to the VM that's uh, creating that node for the virtual cluster. So then you can use GPU as if it, they are like running on bare metal because you don't lose any of the performance stuff there. Yeah, but if you pass through, uh, if it is uh, NVIDIA, right? And if we do pass through or any kind of vGPU, then we have that uh, uh, hit in the performance, right? We need to have a separate driver there so no. performance, it's, it's direct path through. So you have direct I.O. basically there, so. Oh, okay. Yeah. Hi, uh, I have a question on multi-homing. So how do you do load balancing and uh, network policies for the secondary interface on the pod? Like, yep, I, I'm assuming that you have your own um, YAML spec defining the policies. Yeah. Uh, Kubernetes doesn't have services concept for the secondary interface. So yep. does, it should not translate to a service on Kubernetes. So can you explain more? Yeah. So when I mentioned that there are projects like Multus that support additional networks but are not feature rich, this is what I meant. Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah. So you can provide connectivity, yes. but you can't provide the secondary interface as a backend to a load balancer. Correct. Right. So we supported all of that using this multi-networking API. And that's part of this KDN stack, and that's what we're trying to bring to Kubernetes open source. So I'm assuming that the front end would look like a Kubernetes object, but the back end would be an implementation of your own. Is that correct? Yeah. So basically, now when you define a load balancer, you have to say, I want a load balancer on this network. Yes. Right? And here are my back ends. Go find if these back ends have a leg in that network. If they have a leg in that network, use that interface as my back end, as my endpoint. Right? So you identify um, if you have front end pods that are supposed to be in red and blue, right? And uh, red network is management, and blue network is data plane. You can define a load balancing service for the red network and say, go find these front end pods for the red network. So our controllers will go figure out that these pods have red and blue, but use the red network's interfaces and IP addresses as an endpoint in the endpoint slices for that load balancer. OK, so now the next part of the question. So the network policies has to be implemented per CNI. So the, it depends on what CNI you use as the backend. Yes. That CNI will have its own implementation of the network policies. Correct. So your network policies spec cannot be generic, right? It has to be, you, you can have some kind of an overlay yeah. network, uh, like what you mentioned as multi-tenants, but yeah. you can only support like an OVS or an OVN or a Calico or a CDM. Yeah. But yeah. like other CNIs, it has to be, it's work in progress. Is that correct? Yeah. So we use CDM as a base, right? But what we expose to customers is, remember that I spoke about multi-cluster network policy. There's mm -hmm. nothing like multi-cluster network policy yeah, today. Correct. So we defined a policy called project network policy. It's, it's like multi-cluster network policy. That gets translated by our controllers into individual network policies for each cluster. And these are just Kubernetes network policies. 
But when we define those network policies, we had annotations to say which network is this network policy for. And that our controllers will parse and identify that if I have a pod again with red and blue networks, go, go put this network policy only for the red network endpoints. Okay. Got it. Thanks. Uh, I think we're Hi. Um, oh, we're over time. We're over I can take one more question. Yeah. Um, sorry. Thanks for the great talk. Uh, I think it painted a great picture altogether. Um, so you're talking about multiple clusters here. So is there like some sort of a placement API that decides? So what I'm imagining is when I deploy this platform, I would see a GCP account of sorts with a VPC that I can create. So when a user comes and creates workloads, how do you decide which underlying Kubernetes cluster that goes to? So do you have a heuristic you use to distribute everything? Because that, I don't think that piece exists in the open source world today. Yeah. So I think there's a scheduling component to it, and there's a networking component. I assume you're asking about the scheduling component. Right, yeah. OK. Do you want to take it or should I take it? Uh, I, so basically, when you deploy a VM, we have only one bare metal cluster per zone. So there's no decision that needs to be made. You just need to figure out in the bare metal cluster, where does that VM fit? So, the, so it's, it's, it's just like cloud. Right? There's one big server farm. OK. The only difference is when you deploy containers or pods. Right? So there, we have multiple options here. We have a concept that says, hey, we can, you, a user can create multiple user clusters, and they can span their project or expand their project across those user clusters, and you can define which user cluster you can go towards. This is like more like fleet management, right? Uh, but I think we're working towards a more common API um, uh, schema where you can say, actually, there are a few options here. We can say, hey, deploy, we don't have um, a mechanism yet to, to automatically detect which user cluster to go deploy, because they could be a test, production, development, et cetera, right? We also have some plans to support a whole user cluster inside a project, just like how GKE and EKS and AWS works, right? So scheduling across user clusters is a very customer um, unique this thing, depending on how the customers are deploying those user clusters, right? So we'll have to wait for some customer feedback to see if we need to do something there. But VM scheduling is pretty straightforward. There's only one infra cluster. Got it. Um, so you're talking about Qbert, and Cilium OSS, I don't think, supports Qbert. Like, so is there a plan on open sourcing some thing? Uh, can I ask you for yeah. we, can, we can talk maybe here. We can, we can sure. talk offline. Yeah. Uh, Thank you. This is not our call. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thanks for all the all right. questions. Yep.